Give them the spirit that is teachable. Give them the spirit that want to learn at your feet. Give them the spirit, oh Lord my God, that desire you more than riches and gold. In the name of Jesus, Almighty God, we pray, Lord, that our men, oh Lord, they will have a new spirit, a spirit of Caleb, a spirit of Joshua, a spirit that make them to stand out, even in their generation. In the name of Jesus, my God and my Lord, visit our men with your word. Send your word, oh Lord. Send your word, oh Lord. Send your word to our men. Send your word to our men. In the name of Jesus. 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 Our Lord and our God. Make our men, oh Lord, a spiritual father indeed. In the name of Jesus. A spiritual example. In the name of Jesus. You look at Abraham. You say, Lord, you trust Abraham. That he will teach his children. Oh, my Lord and my God. Our God and our Father. We cry unto you, Lord, that our men will take their place. There will be men indeed, oh Lord. In our home, oh Lord, in our church, oh Lord, Almighty God, they will not be strolling in and strolling out as one that has no purpose for coming to your presence, as if they are your junior brother, or they are just like somebody who is just coming, Lord my God, as if you are their junior brother, and they can come here and arrogate themselves. Lord, take pride away from our men. Take less and fear attitude from them. Lord, visit our men. Give them zeal for your presence. That make them want to run at your command. That make them want to go and win so. That make them want to humble, oh Lord, even to sweep the church. In the name of Jesus, tonight, oh Lord, wherever all the men of us of Tanya, Lord, send your word to them. 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 Wake them up, oh Lord. Visit them, oh Lord. Visit our men, oh Lord. Visit our men, oh Lord. In the name of Jesus, let there be revival. In Jesus' precious name, we are praying. Amen. Thank you very, very much. Dickiness, and I uh, hope you've had enough time to pray. <laughs> uh, apologies for that. We had some technical challenges. Uh, that means God wants to do something, and he wanted us to pray anyway. Well, so we thank God for that prayer time. Father, we thank you. Open our hearts. Speak to us. Change us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, we thank God today. Uh, we're not going to exceed our time. We're still going to try and see what we can do. But I believe everything works together for good. Nothing takes God by surprise. And God can intervene and interrupt and bring it to the way he wants to do it. And I love that. So be rest assured that tonight God will speak to us in Jesus' name. So let's uh, put this in mind. Uh, this is the time of Bible study. Please get your families together. Um, let's, uh, let's listen to the word of God. I know... Many of us have been through several things today, so um, let me just try and see if I can get us ourselves into a right frame of mind um, of Bible studies. But let me just read this. Since I, I'm, I don't have the opportunity to be able to do the video, but let's see if this one can, uh, some people can catch this joke or not. If you catch it, uh, type yes. If you get it, type yes. If you don't get it, uh Tell, tell, just type that you flew over your head or something like that, but I'm going to read that joke anyway. It says, a lady was on the airplane and was reading the Bible. The man sitting next to her said, you don't believe that stuff in there, do you? She said, of course I do. It's the Bible. He said, what about that guy that got swallowed by a whale? She said, you mean Jonah? Yes, I believe that too. He said, how could he possibly live that long inside a well? She thought about it. She said, I don't know. When I get to heaven, I'll have to ask him. He said, sarcastically, what if he's not in, what if he's not in heaven? She said, then you're going to have to ask him. <laughs> I hope you got the, that joke. Um, if you don't get it, maybe by by the time you rewind this, if you <laughs> rewind this back, you will get it and read it. Amen. So tonight is a very wonderful topic we want to talk about. It's gonna it's going to address everyone. Um, it talks about the tragedy of faith failure. Uh, the tragedy of faith failure. We'll try and see how we can make up for some lost time. The tragedy of faith failure. You you're gonna need this. Um, we are going to need this teaching because at the time we are in uh, and the time moving forward and some of the things that have happened in our lives in the past shows that we will need this teaching. 
the, our principal text is going to be taken from um, the book of Luke, chapter 22, verses 31 to 32. By the way, this is av um, available electronically, so if you want it. Um, uh, Luke chapter 22, verses 31 to 32. The Bible says here, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. But I have ple pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. The next scripture is Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 12, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, and he says, Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And I'm going to read our introductory scripture in Luke 22, 31 to 32, was a statement by our Lord Jesus Christ to Simon Peter, the leader of his disciples. There are so many insights that these two verses provide beyond their immediate application. First, it lets us know that there will be a time when we will be sifted like wheat. In other words, our faith in Jesus and the relationship we have enjoyed with him, along with all the teachings we have been taught, will be put to test. That is the truth. The Christian life and Christian race is not bread and butter. We will be challenged on those things we've been taught. They will be stressed. It's not going to be a fun time. It's not going to be a fun time. We will be stressed. There will be a time when all the teachings we've learned will be put to test. And we will have to uh, decide what we want to do. Now, put in our life. You may, you may, you may. You may wonder why will I allow it to test? I mean, test. I was in the military. I lived for eight years, four years active, four years reserves, and I know that we do put ourselves to test all the time. We run drills, and sometimes it could be one a.m. in the morning or two a.m. when you're sleeping, or you just got off watch and you want to catch some sleep. You only slept for thirty minutes or one hour, and you had that loud noise. And they blow the alarm. And that means everybody get out. You will get out of your bed, whatever you're doing. And I'm talking about in the middle of the ocean. And we are just cruising along. And you just, you've been walking. You've walked maybe 18 hours a day. And you just jump on your bed. You took some shower. Took, jump on your bed. Okay, let me have some sleep. And um, you hear that sound. Big sound. General quarters, general quarters. All oh, man, mount your battle station. You're going to jump out of your bed. You will jump out of your bed, doesn't matter, and you run through the drills. It might be a drill of fire, it might be a drill of water, it might be a drill that they ram the ship or deal, uh, a, a, a missile will land on the ship or something, or you have to attack anyone. You have to get out. So being stressed is not um, something, it's not fun, but it's something that we go through. And even in your life, you know, you go through stress as well. So in our country here in the US, I go back to the book, banks are put to stress test. By the Federal Reserve, yes, banks are stressed. They are put to stress test to find out what are they made of. According to Food.com, as part of the sweeping dot Frank Act legislation for banks, following the Great Recession, the Federal Reserve puts bank holding companies through various economic scenarios each year to determine whether banks can main maintain adequate capital if a severe re recession were to occur. The goal of this is to make sure banks can continue to provide credit to individual borrowers and businesses during a downturn. We all remember in the recession of 2008 to 2009 when the whole bubble burst. Because of that, you know, the Dodd-Frank legislation was passed. And now because many banks went under, many insurance financial institutions went under. So many things were crafted to address that. So as a result of that, now the Federal Reserve Bank, which is the one that is in control of that bank of all banks and regulate them, put banks to stress, and they will publish the results. The results of these stress tests are published for the public to see. The correlation to our study of today is that Satan would request from God permission to perform acts that will stress and stretch our faith. Yes. 
This will come through any number of sources from which I outline below. God would allow it. So I want you to sit down very well and listen to this because this teaching is something you, you may not, we may not hear in many churches today. But it will happen. And that's the reality. Satan will ask permission from God to test us. To stress us. To allow situations in our life that will stress us. We'll, it might be well after time we just get out of church and dancing and jumping. Satan is waiting to stress. And God would allow it. Yes, God will allow it. So let's look at some of the sources of faith failure. Remember, we're talking about the tragedy of faith failure. One, persistent and protracted problem. You, I mean, that, that, that's, that's in itself is it, it, something for you to know. Persistent and protracted problems. There are several things that could cause one's faith to fail. One of the reasons that causes the faith of many to fail is persistent Excuse me, or protracted problems. When we have a problem or challenges in any area of our lives as Christians, we pray. And I hope we do pray. Don't be like that guy that uh, uh, one of the governors in Africa that just died not too long ago. And I was listening to what he said, if you, if you probably heard what he said. Um, I think, I uh, first of all saw one of his interviews on radio, and he said um, that. He only uh, told God that he wanted to live up to 70 years. He said, because the dad never lived up to 70 years. He's a Muslim. He said, he wants to live up to 70 years. He said, because the dad never said up to 70 years. So he said, now, you know, then, because then, he, then he said, well, I, I, then I started seeing something. And when I was approaching 70, he said, I started seeing something funny. He said, oh, then I said, oh, maybe I should change it to 96 years or something like that. He said, because he started noticing something funny. So he said, then some of the imams then told, you know, say, okay, we'll help you pray to God for 96 years or something. Now, that's one side. Another time, he was in open camp. Um, he was outside in a, you know, like I think one of these political rallies. And he was saying that um, he has never fasted one day in his life. He said, all this fasting and whatever. He said, I have no one to fast. He said, that's too much. He said, I, I can give you money. You can do stuff. But me, fast? That's too much fast. Did he fast that fast? And I said, oh, no wonder. No wonder he died. Because he keep boasting about it. I've never fasted for one day in my life. And I told my wife, they will come and tell us, do this, do that. Uh, and, and, and they will say this. So they said, no, it's too much. Why would I want to fast? He said, no wonder he died. No wonder he died. Because, he, he, number one, that shows his generational curse and protracted problems. He's passing down from the father, and, and he never dealt with it. Anyway, so as Christians, we pray. For some Christians, not being able to have a child of their own after several years of praying to God is their protracted problem. In addition to prayers, they have sowed seeds. They have taken steps of faith, like buying children clothes and attending all manner of special programs with no results. That's the truth. Each time they pray and results appear elusive, it chips away their confidence in God. Many have been demoralized. Even though they appear to be expressing the act of faith outwardly, inwardly they are bitter and sad. They have lost the ability to have faith. Maybe you are one of such. You have probably sold Countless faith seeds, given prophetic offerings for your papers, believe God for spouse with no progress, apparent lack of such progress has made many to take ungodly shortcut. I mean, you know, I mean, just let's be real. Let's be real. Um, you've been praying about something and, and, and nothing happened, nothing came out of it. What will you do? You, I mean, you, 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 let's say you come to one of our, or one of our programs and you pray and, and you pray, you sow the seed of, you know, snow or God's visitation, visitation and many of those things. And you sow your seed and, you, and nothing happened. So what do you do? It chips, you have to be frank that it chips away one's confidence when you've tried so many things and nothing appears to be working. Now, so what, what happened many times is that some people they start taking on godly shortcut. Some have gotten married to have papers. I know you've heard about that. 
Others have gone out of marriages to impregnate someone else because of the desperation for children. Yes, because the protracted problems that they have been going through, they have been praying, they have been fasting, and time is going. They are 25, now they've gone in 15 years of marriage and 10 years of marriage. And, and, and as long as the problem is long and prolonged and extended, I mean, Imagine we would advertise and tell people, come, God will give you children. God will give you your papers. God. And they come. Imagine if you have been at the first snow that was started in uh, January 2012. And God gave you a promise. And up till now, nothing has happened. How will you feel? How excited will you be when they call for another fast? How excited will you be to fast again? How excited will you be to pray again? Those are some of the sources like I mentioned, of uh, uh, faith failures. Some char characteristics of persistent and protracted problems are, A, number one, persistent and protracted problems are sent from hell to make someone abandon or fall short of their purpose of living. B, they have their origins from demonic walls so that it will be beyond the capacity of a natural person to solve. If you can solve that problem, then it's not going to have that uh, impact on your on your faith. See, they frustrate an individual. Yes, because you've tried so many ways. You've heard of this medical doctor. You've heard of this paper and tried this program and tried this business and tried that business. But nothing happened. You woke up at night. They've told you fast and pray for seven days and nights. And so nothing happened. And that's the reality of the Christian life. And guess what? God allows the devil to, to try you. So what do you do? D, they make someone doubt the efficacy of prayers, love of God for them, and even the assistance of God. Yes, sometimes when our prayers don't get answered, we doubt whether our prayers work. We doubt the love of God for us, and we even doubt the existence of God. You know, uh, um, I've met many people. I have a friend, where someone that went in the Navy together, that what turned him to become an atheist is because his, his mom had cancer. And he prayed, and he, I think it was Catholic, he prayed and nothing happened. The mom died. Because of that, he, he became an atheist. Sadly, last year, his wife shot himself. So I'm, I'm thinking now, so where are you going to blame now? You can't blame God now. But, but then he goes angry again that that's one of the reasons. If you believe, then... then you are on your own in the first place because you already said there's no God. So why should God care about you? Because he was putting his faith in a wife and everything, but the wife shot himself. She shot herself. E, they make a person irritable and awful. Have you seen, you know? F, lead some to the devil for solutions. It may start as a mistake, but complicated by saying, we've seen many cases where some people have gone to many things just to make ends meet. And we're going to read about some of them. Now, Protracted problems are not new. I want you to know that. Regardless of what yours is, maybe it's an L challenge, maybe it's your papers, maybe it's your money situation, maybe it's your lack of job, maybe it's you're not able to have children, maybe you don't have a spouse. I want you to know that they are common occurrences. No one is immune from this problem. Not even your leaders. Not even your leaders. Everybody has something to deal with. Perhaps this may provide some relief. You should know that we, we all have protracted problems or challenges at some point in our lives. I, I was watching God's generals uh, last week. Throughout, I mean, I was really excited watching uh, Robert Laird and who wrote some of this book on God's generals. And they had this week long, they were talking to him and he was telling us some of this men of God. They had about five days and we were just listening to him talking about this man of God. And he mentioned that Oral Robert, you know, Oral Robert was someone that, uh, I think, yeah, it was Oral Robert. And uh, he, of course, God, God has used our robot to heal many people and does many things and does many signs and wonders. And he was telling us about him that someone came to him and said, Oro, so what happened that? <laughs> of course, our robot is very frank and tells the truth. He said, well, what happened that you pray for somebody and the other people and they've been healed and they've been delivered? He said, but he has, our robot has a shoulder problem that rotated off the cuff and wasn't, wasn't healed. And our robot said, look, I've tried this stuff. It, did, it just didn't work. 
He said he has prayed. It never worked. So what do you say to that? Paul the apostle told us, he said, there was a affliction in his body and he prayed to the Lord three times. And God said, nah, my faith is sufficient for you. So what I'm saying, no matter how anointed you are, no matter how powerful you are, there will be at least something you're going to be believing God for. That's going to be a, a protracted problem that you might, you will deal with. Let's look, look at the book of 1 Peter 5, 9b. The apostle Peter wrote to believers that their faith is being tried like others in the world. And I'll read from the J.B. Phillips version. He said, for you know that your believing brothers and sisters around the world are experiencing the same kinds of troubles you endure. Abraham and, and Job had protracted problems. Abraham was barren for, what, 25 years? 24 years, 25 years. Job also had a problem that God gave permission to Satan to try him. So, it's not something new. The, the second one, another source of protracted problems, uh, or another source of faith failure is unexpected tragic events. 2 Kings 6, 24 to 33, you know, we saw the case of um, Sisej on Samaria where people were hitting their children. And I wrote it here. Sometimes, even Christians, we, even as Christians, we face or experience unexpected tragic events. Now, there are some events that God will reveal to us before they happen. And others could be withheld from us. Still, others, we are only given... Uh, pressure information. For example, look at the coronavirus pandemic that we are currently in, which is now a tragedy that came on the world. It wasn't something, I've never heard of anybody that had the full picture of the magnitude or, or the extent of coronavirus. I say, okay, God told me something's coronavirus, and he mentioned, I said, coronavirus will happen. It's going to shut down churches. It, nobody knew that. And, and I'm sure this has caused faith of many to fail because nobody knew. And in the world, we've seen, we've seen uh, the stories of medical personnel who have committed suicide just because of the magnitude of, of the coronavirus, and they had no answer to it. Even this was, like I wrote, was hidden from the most accurate of prophets. Yes. I mean, why? Why? Yet this has upended many lives and is reshaping the world. Why was something, think about it, why was something with the potential to shut the door of churches for months withheld from the church? You want to think about that? Something that has the potential to shut the church, churches for months, why was he withheld from the church? Yeah, at least if you have known that, something is coming that's going to shut the old church. I'm sure Christians will have prepared. Am I right? But guess what? God did not tell us the full picture of what it was. Thank God he told us in House of Change that disease is coming last year. We know that. And we started praying and look at what God has done because of that. We have been spared from the scourge of COVID-19. Glory to God. Amen. But he still didn't give us the full picture of what was going to happen. He just said, just, you know, be praying. Now. Many have lost their jobs during this pandemic. Several thousands, hundreds of thousands have died. Over 10 million people have been infected, including Christians. Even some Christians have died. This has enough impact to weigh down even the believer with the strongest faith. How do we respond to such? Unexpected tragic events have caused the faith of many to fail. I want you to know that I always say it. There's no strong Christian in the world. That's, that's my belief. You may argue with me. <laughs> There's no strong believer in the world. It's only that God has not allowed the problem that will overwhelm you to happen to you. That's the truth. That's the truth. Elijah just called down fire and all that stuff, right? But when, <laughs> when the devil just got to, just a woman, he could have called down fire on Elijah. Man, he never even thought about that. It's only because of the grace of God that has not allowed the problem that will overwhelm us to come to us. Thank you, Lord. A few years ago, a tragic event happened to a family that we knew. The father worked in another part of the country in Africa. And usually, if the man travels back and forth to see his family, wife and children, on one of these trips, 
the man who happened to be a Christian unexpectedly had an accident and died. I remember the man. He was a CEO. Big company. It was a devastating blow to the family. It was a tragic loss. As tragic events go, they tend to expose us. You know that? They tend to expose us. I remember that one of the statements the wife, who was also a Christian, made at the time was that she had always told the late husband to get some charms or amulet to tie around his car. But he always said that Jesus was enough. So she implied that the satanic assistance will have prevented the accident or, pro or protected her husband. Look at that. That's what we talk, talk about tragedy. I mean, the tragedy of the faith failure. Number three. And this one I wrote about in my book, um, um, uh, Save Me From This Hour. Another source of faith failure is when natural and spiritual laws are suspended so that a believer could go through a trial of faith. Oh, my God. Ordinarily, the coming together of a man and woman in marriage ought to produce a child. However, this could be suspended in order for the couple to go through a trial of faith. You know that happens? It happened to Abraham. And but look at Lot. Lot never had that. And Lot was not a person of covenant. Also, there are certain spiritual actions that produce spiritual results as commanded by the Lord. However, this could also be suspended in order for the believer, for the faith of a believer to be tried. Let's examine the story of Job in the Bible, which I mentioned again in my book, Seven from this hour. It was a righteous man who loved God and hated evil. He was dinked out of everyone else in the, in the East at the time. Accordingly, the spiritual laws that govern being righteous produce the expected results. Yes, when we're sowing and we're reaping and we're getting, we are very excited. We love it when everything is going well, right? Among them were wealth and riches will be in the house. Job was the richest man. Job was also the wealthiest man in the East. In addition, the righteous is guaranteed protection. Job, Job was protected, notwithstanding in his time of trial of faith, these laws were suspended. They were suspended so he could fully go through and be processed through as if going through a ringer. When the devourer came in, he went through and decimated everything that he had. The edge of protection was also removed. Bear in mind, again, that it was not because of Job's sins or lack of faith that generated all these calamities, but God allowed it. After Satan tried everything, including killing all his children in one day, and severely afflicting him, he didn't deny his faith in God. Satan even inspired his wife to persuade him to cause God and die. Because Satan has thrown everything at him and he didn't fail. So Satan said, well, spoke through the wife. Cause God and die. Now, let me put it, let me put it to, you know, let's, let me relate to us one-on-one. -on -one and think about a problem in your life. What is the benefit of serving God when what he promised wasn't coming through? When, what is the benefit of serving God when what he has promised you is not coming through? I don't want us to overlook this because it's a reality for many. Suspension of spiritual or natural laws has caused many to deny their faith and look for alternatives. Let's look at it this way. If a human being promised to do something for you or give you something, you will believe that person, right? Until they give a reason to doubt. If several opportunities present them themselves and they didn't deliver... You will naturally stop believing the person. That's what we do, right? If somebody says, I'm going to give you this, I'm going to give you this, I'm one month, two months, three months, and the person, you eventually will stop believing the person. Many Christians now transfer this to their relationship with God as well. They are giving their tithes and offerings, but only become poor as a result. Consequently, they've sought alternative solutions that shipwreck their faith. I remember the quote that I read of a popular secular female uh, musician. I mean, I know this person. I'm, going to, I'm not going to mention her name. She was born to a family of ministers, you know, the pastors. I'm telling you, I'm, many of the musicians they, today, many of them started from the church. You'll be surprised. Many of these big names that you hear. And now, I mean, our goal was to be the Amy Grant of Christian music, if you know what, who Amy Grant is. And she's a very popular Christian musician. She was doing, now this lady was doing Christian songs. However, as time went on, she never got the traction that she wanted. She said, so I sold my soul to the devil. She probably meant it jokingly, but that's, you know, she, she went off and became a secular musician. Now, guess what? She has had several hits. And she's still living and making hits. Why? Because 
She couldn't, I mean, the, the, the laws that makes her to succeed has been suspended. She said, well, let me find an alternative. And she's making hits. But we're, we're going to get more into that later on. Number four, weariness on battles. Another source of failure is weariness on battles. As Christians, we are on the battlefield. The day we made the decision to follow Christ, we became targets for the devil. However, constant battles have the effect of wearing out even the breath of souls. When some believers engage battle on multiple fronts, this sometimes discourages them and leads to failure of their faith. Five, lack. Deuteronomy 8, 2. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and, and, and to find out whether or not you obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry. Don't forget that word. And then feeding you with manna. God let you go hungry. A food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. It did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Very often, what makes the faith of several Christians to fail is lack. I have seen several cases of some Christians who reverted back to their former ways or even went to explore their religions because of the lack they experienced. I've seen many crazy Christians who are poor who have gone many ways just so that because of the poverty that they've been experiencing. Another thing that makes the faith to fail is peer pressure. You know, many Christians have abandoned their faith because they are in environments where sin is prevalent. They share abundance of sin within easy reach, and sometimes the peer pressure of their associates have caused them to give in. I've said it before, and I said it the last time. You know, sin is very easy these days in, in, in the technology environment that we are. Facebook, all kinds of medium you can easily commit sin and nobody will know except God. The Bible told us that there will be so much sin everywhere that the love of many Christians will forgo who ask God. I mean, you've seen it. People are saying that the Bible is evolving, that everything has been accepted because so much sin is everywhere. Now, let's go to number two. Remember, we're talking about the sources of, um, of faith failures. Now, we're going to go to faith failure has consequences. How do we know that someone's faith failed? It means that their faith was graded. People of God, let me tell you, God does great faith. If he doesn't, he won't say you have little faith. He won't say I've never seen such a great faith. He won't say you have no faith. That means God grades faith. I remember a revelation, again, I mentioned in my book, where I asked several years ago, and God was showing me he was grading my faith. He shows me that he grades faith, and he was showing me, okay, this, you got this, yes, you got God grades your faith. Now, these are some of the consequences of the failure of faith. There are two, there are two ways I want us to address it. When, obviously, if, if there's no way, there's no remedy to, to faith, failure of faith, then we'll not be having this Bible study. But at least, there are two ways, there are two things I'm going to mention about failure of faith. Number one is temporary. Your faith can fail temporarily. And we see that in the Bible, and we're going to talk about it. And your faith can also fail permanently, which is the tragic one. Abraham, the father of faith, surprisingly, you know, you can read that scriptures. Um, Genesis 16, 1 to 3. I'm not going to read it because of our time. When Abraham, when Sarah was not able to have children, um, she suggested to Abraham that, look, Abraham, um, you know, we're not able to have child now. God has been promising us day in, day out, which is what happened. I mean... After a while, he started telling on you. So he said, he told Abraham, look, uh, maybe what God meant was um, eager. You know, we are past bearing child. Maybe what God meant was eager because in that culture at that time, even when she had, if the child of eager will belong to her, will belong to Abraham, and will belong to her because she's a, she's a slave girl. Just like the, um, the, um, the handmaid of Leah and Rachel, all the children are still attributed to Leah and Rachel because they are just their handmaid, Bill, her, and Zilper. So she said, you know what? My handmaid is there, and this slave girl, you know, sleep with her. Whatever comes, is she going to be our child? Surprisingly, Abraham, the father of faith, had faith failure. So I'm telling you, you know, Abraham, the father of faith himself, had faith failure. He agreed with the wife. I mean, after waiting on God for dozens of years without a biological child, he caved in to pressure from his wife and slept with Agar maid, 
When Abraham gave in to his wife's suggestion and slept with a maid, he produced a child named Ishmael, which we know. And we're talking about the consequences of faith failure. A child that they've been longing for. You know, you've got in that paper you've been looking for. You've got in that money you've been waiting for. It may appear as a small decision until at least major unintended consequences resulted from their simple actions. Number one, first, it broke off communication between God and Abraham that lasted 13 years. For 13 years, God never spoke to Abraham because of this. That man, any sacrifice that Abraham gave as he normally does, but there was no response from God. God was silent. Next, he put any blessing that God had for him on hold. Whenever you fail God, it will put some, something will happen. Also, it extended the expiration date of the barrenness of Sarah, which inversely meant that the satanic stronghold was strengthened for at least another 13 years. That's the truth. Those 13 years will have been avoided if they had been faithful to God. It also, of course, pierced long-term sorrows in, the, in their hearts. Now, if I have to go by historical fact, the present-day Arabs are descendants of Ishmael, right? Now, look at it. The descendants of the child Abraham and Sarah got, when their faith failed, is now in perpetual hostility with the true blessing that God gave them. And that's what always happens. When you go to get it your way, the way you get it will fight with what God has for you. Amen. So up to today, they're still fighting the, the Jews. They are sworn enemy. I mean, you know that they are sworn enemy of the Jews. Now, which is something when I discover that, it's funny. Going by this, we we'll also say that all the blessings that Isaac who would have inherited alone, he had to share it and abdicate it with all the, his, his brothers as well, because they came from Abraham. Imagine all the oil in the Middle East, the oil in Saudi Arabia, the oil in UAE, the oil in Iran, Iraq, Oman, Yemen, and all these other countries that would have accrued to Isaac alone. He had to give it to them. And monetary-wise, monetary-wise, all those countries have more trillions than Israel itself. Even though Israel has something. But all those countries, you combine all the petrol dollars together, they have more money than Israel. Why? Because of a single mistake that their forefathers did many, many years ago. Just look at it. God said, I'm going to bless Ishmael, Ishmael also because he came from your loins. So when you make mistakes, when, when our faith fails, he has consequences beyond what we think it is. The next one is permanent faith failure. Wow, let me see how, if you can just give me 10 extra minutes because to just make up for all this time with, uh, that we need to catch up on. Permanent faith failure. Number one, the children of Israel. Um, if you look at that, Deuteronomy 132, and I'm going to read 132 to 35. But even after he all he did, you refused to trust the Lord your God. That's Moses speaking. Who goes before you looking for the best place to camp, guiding you with a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day? He was talking to the children of Israel. When the Lord heard your complaining, he became very angry. So he solemnly swore, not one of you from this wicked generation will live to see the good and land I swore to your ancestors. That means we've talked about the temporary faith failure. Now this is the worst one, the permanent one. Temporary faith failure is not addressed will eventually lead to permanent faith failures with no room for repentance. This is the most tragic place to be. In many cases, with various tests that the children of Israel faced, they had failed. They failed when they were thirsty on at least two occasions. You remember that? Their faith failed when they worshipped the golden calf because they thought they, um, Moses was gone for too long. However, their faith was sealed when they completely doubted God after 10 of the 12 spies returned from spying out Canaan with bad reports. At this point, God will no longer tolerate their unbelief anymore. Do you know that? Out of the estimated 2 million people that left Egypt for the promised land, only 2 people made it. Why? Because their faith failed. Permanent. God said, you know what? I've given you guys food. I've given you that. You guys still continue to doubt me. He said, none of you guys will enter the promised land. It doesn't matter how many believers whose faith failed. If they failed, they're not going to make heaven. Amen. 
Number three. Number two, Judas Iscariot. I'm not going to read that. You can go and read it, John 12 and Matthew. Judas Iscariot was one person that had a permanent failure. Could you remember? Could you imagine being a disciple of Jesus Christ, seeing Jesus face to face, performing miracles, healing the sick, doing all kinds of miracles, and still not make heaven? That's the worst thing. Many of us, we, we have not seen Jesus face to face. We only believe. Judas met with Jesus, ate with Jesus, talked with Jesus, performed miracles. And yet, he was permanently barred from the kingdom of God. Now, like I said, permanent faith failure doesn't just start in one day. It starts gradually. And that's what I want us to pay a close attention to. Because many of us are in this state. And I'll summarize this place. Don't forget that Judas Iscariot was, a, was the treasurer of the disciples. He was their treasurer. He kept money. But the Bible tells us that he always stole from the purse. And guess what? Even though Jesus knows everything, Jesus never called him out for stealing. So because Jesus never said anything, he was getting away with it. He thought, well, maybe Jesus doesn't know. Or maybe Jesus will not call him out. Or maybe Jesus has given up. And that is the truth with many of our Christians today. Because we have not come on, because the uh, servants of God have not come on the pulpit and say, oh, somebody you are doing this, you are sleeping with somebody. We we'll think that God is not seen. That is the worst thing, as, that's the worst assumption. Because eventually, if you don't treat that, it will lead to a permanent faith failure. That is the worst place to be. Because God is not mentioning your case, your sin, does not mean that God does not see it. I mean, you just need to talk to anyone who works in the revel I mean, the gift of revelation. They will tell you so many things God sees and tells them. They will tell you. Because imagine Jesus knew that Judas was stealing and he didn't see anything. And he knew that he was stealing. Can you imagine that they will probably go and got some money and they said, how much was in a purse? And Judas would say... Um, it was, no, we had uh, uh, $50 uh, left, even though he already stole $80. And Jesus just accepted and, and believed. Now, one of the greatest errors to make as a believer is to mistake God's silence for approval. We must always remember that God sees everything. If he never reveals it or says anything about it, it could be one or two things. Number one, he wants you to repent. Number two, it's fatal. That means, the second one means he has given up on you and we allow you to be destroyed. If God is not saying anything about you at all, your sin, he's either giving you time to repent or he has set his mind to allow you to, be, to, to self-destruct. And that's what happened to Judas. This is a hard saying. There are many that Jesus will not pray for or stop praying for because of the condition of their heart. Jesus will not pray for a person whose house has been set on continually doing evil or practicing unbelief. Now, Judas sold his master and betrayed him. Even after he tried to show penance, the devil quickened his destruction by telling him there was no more remedy. Qu consequently, he killed himself without any room for repentance. Number three is Emnios and Philodus. You know, they also spread in radical teaching, which the Bible called cancer. And they also overthrown people's faith. The fourth one, which you probably heard of, is Demas. Demas was another person who started out well. Paul mentioned him, commended him because of his love, because of what he was doing for Christ. But eventually, the Bible say, because of his love for this world, he abandoned the faith. And, I, and I've been thinking, what was, what was happening in that world then that made him to abandon his faith? They, they, they were not even technologically advanced as we are. What did he see in that world that made him to abandon Christ? Can you, can you think of that? They didn't have airplanes. They didn't have cars. They didn't have dollars. They, didn't, they can't. What, did he, what made him? What attracted him? Have you thought of that? What is attracting you now? What worldly attraction is sucking you in? What is in this present world that is sucking you in that is competing for your love with Christ? Is uh, a sexual sin, is. is Family loyalty is possession, acceptance, prestige, power. Is it worth going to hell for? Demas never had any more chance. Paul said he loved this world. Maybe because he saw Paul in prison and he ran away. 
Now I'm thinking, so how long did Demas live? Did he live 200 years? He didn't. No matter what love he had, he died one day, which everybody will die. Is that enough to miss heaven for? Now, some indicators or one of signs of, fa- of faith failure, please, let's look at this. Unchecked and unrepentant sins. That's, if you, are, you have unrepentant sins, you are walking towards permanent faith failure. Number two, if you have an evil act of unbelief, if you're always unbelief and doubting and doubting the man of God, doubting the word of God, gradually you, you are walking towards faith failure. If you're believing and practic- practicing heretical teachings, you've had so many nonsense today. Now, people are talking about God. God is the love of all. He loves everybody. Every, just let's live it up. No. The, the Bible said, they sta- he said, that, he said the, nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure. He said, the Lord knows his own. He said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord must run away from iniquity. Now, number four, I have good news because you can still recover if your faith has failed temporarily. The first thing you need to do is you need to hone it. The good news with God today is that under grace, there's always a door for second chance as long as we are still living. As long as we are still living, there's always a door for second chance. The first step in recovering from faith failure is go back to the last place of obedience and own it. Every disobedience as follows. We must go to God for forgiveness and restoration. Sometimes this may also include restitution where we make amends for the wrongs. Restitution of a big impact should be done consultation with the pastors. There's one thing with God. God will not escape, excuse you. Wherever you stop obeying, he will want you to go back there first and then hone it. When um, Abraham failed, God told him, and when God appeared to him in Genesis 17, he said, Abraham, I am the God, the Lord, the God, I'm El Shaddai. He said, now, walk before me and be perfect. God, we always go back. Go back to that purse, hone it, and we'll start recovery process. When Peter failed, Jesus asked him. When he, when he met him back in your paper, if you look at it, he said, Peter, do you love me more than this? Do you love me more than this? Do you love me more than this? He will always go back to the same place because you need to correct the last error that you did. The analogy I will give you is that of computer. You know, I did a little IT, so um, when there is computer, you know that sometimes uh, your computer will crash and you have the blue thing and it will restart. You know that, right? And it will start by itself and it said disk failure is checking, it's checking, it's checking. Sometimes it may be because overheating or something and it will, and it will crash and sometimes it will start by itself. Now, think of those times as temporary failures. Think of that. As temporary failures. You know, think of that as temporary failures. Now, there's something called the last known good configuration, which whatever it is, no matter how your computer has done, if it crashed and nothing is coming up, when it boot up, just press that. It might be F8 or F whatever in your computer. Just press that bar. He said, oh, we ask you, do you want to restore it to the last known good configuration? That's the same thing with God. When you click it, God restores you back to where he saved you before. Then you can hone it. Then you can start working again. And the system will restore you. Now, it will get to a point that your computer will crash totally and will be fried. And nothing you will do will bring it back. I'm sure you know that. There's nothing. I remember there was, there was a hard drive that my brother sent from Africa one time for us to fix it. They couldn't fix it over there. They brought it here. They couldn't fix it either. Yeah. So... Permanent faith failure, you can liken it to when your computer disk is fried and you've tried everything. You tried rebooting, you tried this and that, and it's not working. That is permanent faith failure. If it happens to a uh, uh, computer, do you think it can happen to a human being? Of course, yes. Of course, yes. So the first step is to own it. Believe that, uh, don't give excuses for your, for your, um, for for your, for your weaknesses or, or for your faith failure. Do not. And the second one is associate with people of faith. I mentioned earlier that we all will face protracted problems at some point in our lives. Accordingly, one of the ways to recover is to come closer to, to the congregation of the people of God. Return to church. Among like-minded believers, our faith is strengthened. Alone, we are destroyed. Hebrews 10, 23 said, Let us all tally without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. That means... 
when we face an issue that has refused to budge after countless prayer sessions, do not lose hope. Let's think of ways to motivate each other. One of the things that the devil does for people is, let's say people, some people's faith fell in this place or they did something bad and they are disciplined. What they would do is go to another church that's liberal, that hasn't punished them. People will run to them. And that is the wrong way. When you're faithful, you go back to the same congregation and retrace your steps. The Bible says it's better that your, your body has been punished and your saved is sold from hell. Useful nuggets. Um, I want you to remember that it has, whatever you go through, it has been weight tested. God knows stressful uh, situation is going to come your way. And it has determined whether it's something you can overcome or not. This includes COVID-19. Number two, remember that Jesus already prayed for you. Beyond your prayers, Jesus already prayed for you so that your faith will not fail. Number three, don't stand in your own power. Number four, you have a role to play. Turn to God. In conclusion, I'm going to read this. We have learned that faith failure could be in two ways. It could be temporary which could be recovered from when steps of genuine repentance are taken, it could also be fatal. Abraham, the father of faith, had a temporary faith failure, and he recovered. And today is, is in heaven. The Bible calls him the father of faith. But you never know that this same father of faith also at one point had faith failure because he had recovered. And don't forget that it's not being a Christian now that is the main thing. Being able to remain a Christian till you close your eyes is the main thing. We've seen many, many great ministers of God that have been used by God, and they died in sin. They will go to hell. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Faith failure will also be fatal and permanent. The tragedy of permanent faith failure is beyond just turning back on God. I want you to listen to what I'm going to read, and you, you'll understand what it means. It is beyond taking a shortcut to wealth. It is bigger than having a child outside wedlock. The ultimate purpose is what can you exchange your soul for? That's what it's about. Satan is always looking for what you can exchange your soul for. I ask you, what is your soul worth to you? Matthew 16, 26 says, For even if you are to gain all the wealth and power of this world with everything you offer, you are the cost of your own life. What good would that be? That means if a man could gain the whole world and lose his own soul. So I ask you again, is that man that outside the will of God for your life worth your soul? Is your paper that you're trying to get in the wrong way worth your soul? The characters that we're examining who had permanent faith failures never knew that they were actually exchanging their soul. Do you think if Judas knew, knew that he was selling his soul for 30 pieces of silver? By selling Jesus, do you think he will, not, he will never have thought about it again? And that is one thing we need to think about. You can't just think about it as just paper. He's just having this child. He's just sleeping with this, with this woman. Do you know if that, that is what you extend your soul for? Is that woman, that um, um, wrong relationship, is it worth your soul? And that's why we talk about the tragedy of faith failure. It's still in money worth your soul. It, however, started for, for, like we said, even though eventually Judas was destroyed because of 30 pieces of silver, it started from him stealing from the purse and getting away with it. What do you think you are getting away with? Hebrews 10, 26 says, Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there's no longer any sacrifice that will cover the sins. There's only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. Once someone's faith fails, one of Satan's goal is to accelerate the permanent destruction of the believer so that they are without room for repentance. That's a story I remember now. I was told by a brother. In fact, I remember that story was told by a brother in one of, in one of our conventions, probably in the early 80s international convention in Nigeria. In Nigeria. If I remember well, this brother... And some other brothers, they had backslidden. They were going, they were going to go to church. They were backslidden. And they went out of, you know, the faith. And they started doing other things. And guess what? After they left, if I remember well, at least, you see that? At least one of them died in sin. 
And when the, I'm telling you, when that, that brother gave that testimony, it was a very somber, somber reflection because some of them never got a chance to repent. And when he was telling and, and like really mournful, more, people were just shocked. Because, yes, we, we, how, how do you know that that won't be the last time that you commit that sin? How do you know that you're not going to run out? How do you know that your faith is not going to be fatal? The failure of your faith is not going to be fatal. So I ask you again, what are you exchanging your soul for? And I put a question here. Why did Jesus pray for Peter and did him for Judas? Why did Jesus pray for Peter? If you have the answer, you can type it. Why did he pray for Peter and not for Judas? Right? When we saw the, when we saw the, uh, in, in our opening scripture, he said, he told Peter, um, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. He said, Satan wants to sit you, but I have prayed for you. But he didn't pray for Judas. He did not pray for Judas. Are you one of the people that Jesus is not praying for? I want you to think about that. Especially if you think you're getting away with, with things. And appears as if Jesus is not answering or not doing anything. With what you're doing with your faith. Could it be that Jesus has given up praying for you? This is time for, you, for us to retrace our steps. Because as we mentioned, problems will come. Tragedies will come. Tragic events will come. God will give Satan permission to test us. Now, is our faith going to be standing? Is my faith going to be standing? If you have your faith has failed, what steps are you taking to recover? I hope it begins to stir up some things in our life. You know, if, if we are in that space where some of the things that we've we used to shun and run away from, have become acceptable. That means we are in a dangerous state. The Bible said, love not the world, neither the things of the world. It said, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That is, that's, that's powerful. If you get along with the world, that's what he's saying. If the world accepts you all the time, the love of Jesus is not in you. Because that's what Jesus said. He said, they must hate you because they hated me. If they are not hating you because you're a Christian, you are not a Christian, people of God. Because that means every of your, everything you agree with is what the world agrees with. And there's no way, the, say, uh, Paul, Paul said, do not be deceived. Do, God is not mocked. Neither the idolatry or fornicator. or sin. I don't know why God is bringing this to us. I remember earlier this year I mentioned that, you know, the Lord told me, he said, we are in the last days of the last days. And God is bringing this into us. The tragedy of faith failure, the this and that, the giver of all, the repairing the world of holiness, rebuilding the world of, is your, what is the condition of our faith? The Bible says, walk out our faith, our salvation with trembling and fear. I pray that the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Shall we bow our heads and just begin to talk to God that God will, will, will strengthen us. Will strengthen us so that our faith will not fail permanently. God will strengthen us where we've made mistakes. God will help us to hone up to them. God will help us to change. God will give us a heart of obedience. God will have made, and those who have not given their life to Jesus, I pray this tonight that just say with me that, Lord Jesus, I, I confess my sin. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I believe that you died for me. He rose again, come into my heart and change me in Jesus' name. Come and just begin to talk to God. Begin to rededicate our lives to God. Where we have slipped uh, is not worth it. What are we exchanging our soul for? Am I exchanging my soul for pornography? Am I exchanging my soul for another man's wife? Am I exchanging my soul for lying, for cheating? Am I exchanging my soul for money? Am I exchanging my soul for that sinful boyfriend, sinful girl, girlfriend? What are we exchanging, my soul? Father, help us. Help us. Help us. Help us. Help us and change us. In Jesus' victorious name, we pray. Father, we just want to thank you for tonight. Uh, we want to give you the glory for all you have done. 
Thank you for helping us. We pray that this word will continue to cut through our hearts and that we'll continue to believe you and listen to you. Because the Bible says, whoever the Father loves, he disciplines. We receive this discipline from you. Help us, oh God, so that this word will not judge us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Um, um, it is well, it is well, it is well. Yes, please, you can, um, if you can email that, the, um, the material, you have it already, the, um, the Bible teaching material, uh, if you can email it to everyone, please. Um, also, let's listen to the announcement that we have. Please, let's take out our offering as we give to the Lord. Father, we thank you for this offering. Bless them. Let it be to the furtherance of your gospel. In Jesus' name, we pray. So, um, let's make sure that we um, give, give, go to our government, go, I mean, www.theoutsofchange.org slash give. www.theoutsofchange.org slash give. I'll go to our announcements and, and Pastor Echo would close this service. Okay, so um, let me see what I have here. Don't let us forget that on Sunday, on Sunday, this Sunday will be the drive <laughs> drive through um, birthday celebration for past for Deacon Wagbo 70th birthday please let's be out of mind let's come with gifts let's come let's call him let's be ready to come and celebrate our dear Deacon who has served the Lord meritoriously please let's come and celebrate him his 70th birthday let's be here you know by 1 p.m let's be here. The protocol officers will show us what to do. Again, it's going to be drive-by, just like we did for Pastor Epo. Let's come and celebrate this man of God. Amen. Sunday will be our Super Sunday service. It's going to be explosive because God is doing a new thing for us in this um, second half of the year. Let's remember that we're still holding services online until, you know, further notice will let us know when the church will be meeting again. For congregational meeting, again, it's going to be online. Don't let's forget that it's going to be uh, also probably in faces as well. Please, we had the, our gospel invitation yesterday. As many of you that have been touched, please send us your email. Send us your, I mean, send us your testimonies at gfmihoc at gmail.com. gfmihoc at gmail.com. Please send us. You can also send me a text as well of the testimony. We want to share it with the people of God. And this is an announcement for... Uh, the father of our brother, um, pa, uh, the father of our brother, uh, brother Ben Akishola, the father, Pao Yekunle, James Akintayo, went to be with the Lord uh, yesterday at the age of 89 years. Um, he's the father of our brother Akinshola, Ben Akintayo. Uh, for, uh, he's uh, the father of brother Akintayo again. The father went to be with the Lord yesterday at the age of 89 years old. Please let's reach out to brother Akintayo. Um, on 410-900-3305, 410-900-3305. Let's call him to pray with him. Uh, we shall fulfill our days in Jesus' name. Uh, the funeral plans shall be announced um, by the family. If we have any other announcement, it shall be made known to us and communicate with us. God bless you. Have a wonderful night. Pastor Apple will give the rest. Thank you. That we give God the praise. We give Him honor. We give Him glory. Thank you. Father, we thank you. We appreciate the fact that you've been with us tonight. We thank you for your special grace upon us. Thank you for your word to our hearts. Thank you for your servant whom you use. More of your grace upon his life in Jesus' name. Thank you for all those that tune in this evening to listen to this teaching. It is our prayer that God will build the faith in your hearts. And that God, that which we desire, even as we started up a new month today, may the grace of God never leave us. May God's presence never forsake us. Father, we pray that this new month will bring better things in our lives. This will be a month, O oh God, that will see the new horizon of God in our lives. Father, we thank you. We bless your name. We give you all the praise. 
We give you all the honor. We give you all the glory. We thank you because this shall be a better week. A better week that which we desire. A better week which God will give unto us. New things will begin to happen to us. Father, we thank you. So take all the glory tonight and take all the honor. And let us continue to enjoy the fullness of your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's share the grace and fellowship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Our anchor of 2020, for with God nothing will be impossible. Luke chapter 1 verse 37. The year 2020 is a year of supernatural turning around. And our month of July, it's a month of open doors. Amen. Let's read Psalm 91, verse 10 to 11 together. No evil shall befall us, nor shall any plague come near our dwelling place, for he shall give his angels charge over us and keep us in all our ways. Amen. God bless you. Have a good evening and stay blessed.